Well, thanks so much, Jerry. I, I have the privilege of speaking first, and I'm sitting here today because 30 years ago, I accepted a job as the curator of the Lawn Cemetery. Um, in a very short period of time, I was given the opportunity to run a, the, the whole facility, which uh, included a crematorium and a funeral business. And then for the next two decades, I moved between working for national funeral businesses, running and building a coffin factory, and literally everything you can think of in between, every role in the funeral industry. So I've been fortunate to have this uh, opportunity to have a wide range of, of experiences. And this all came to be challenged uh, about three years ago when, when I was asked how I could reimagine the, and at the end of life rituals and funeral services if they were offered A, through a charitable organisation and B, in service of a charitable purpose. And in this case, it was environmental restoration. Drawing on that, that breadth of experience created a, a concept called Earth Funerals that we're going to talk about a little bit more through the presentation. But suffice to say, one thing about this was that having worked for a national funeral business in Australia, we could instantly see that Earth Funerals should and could and should be a national enterprise. And the fairly challenging idea of creating a national uh, trading enterprise from scratch brought up instantly the requirement for brilliant governance and organisation practices. 15 years ago, I was introduced by a colleague to the ideas of sociocracy and was instantly attracted to consent decision making, transparency, effectiveness, equivalence. But I also realised that I had a massive knowledge gap, and that was the gap in between what I felt was a great idea and I, this gut feeling that sociocracy would be right for earth funerals. But the knowledge gap was how to actually turn that into a trading, very practical trading organisation. And the answer to that came in my uh, meeting and, and subsequent work with my co-presenter, Gina, um, who, as many of you would know, is a part of the Sociocracy Consulting Group. And while they're all in love, like I am, I think, with the ideas of sociocracy, they work in a very practical way through the sociocratic circle method to use that and teach that and apply that those techniques to make ideas become reality. And I think that's a, a nice spot for me to hand over to Gina to... Um, uh, tell you a little bit more about herself and what we're going to be talking about tonight. Thanks, Gina. Thanks, Kev. Well, yes, Gina Price. I came across sociocracy in 2004 when I was involved in an eco-village with my family here in Perth, Western Australia. And I became convinced about the value of sociocracy uh, two years later when that eco-village project folded and it folded because, in my eyes, of a lack of governance structure. Um, and so that sort of firmed up my desire and commitment and kind of passion and hunger to find, to, to, to work with governance structures. So really, so this didn't happen again. I mean, it's devastating to have a, a really great vision and to fall on your face with it <laughs> because you don't have the tools to implement it. So in 2007, I, um, I actually was a founding member of the Australasian Training, Sociocracy Training Consulting Group. No, Australasian Training Group for Sociocracy. We brought a trainer from the US to Perth. We trained 50 people and we got the first organisation to implement. And the next year I went to the Netherlands and met Herald Enderberg and got certified. In fact, I believe I met Jerry then. Anyway, um, and then 2008, I uh, started training my first, doing my first training, which was Narara Eco Village, which was the eco village referred to in the last presentation. And I'm currently a board member on that eco village. So it's been a real privilege to journey long time, uh, over a long time with clients. Um, and now I am a founding member of TSCG and as Jerry said, along with uh, Jerry, we worked there since 2011. Jerry then split off to form the fabulous SOFA. And, um, and 
along the route I've worked with businesses, eco villages, schools, and now the, the funeral industry. And um, I am really enjoying getting to, I think one of the things I like about my work is the variety of clients. And um, so I'm learning a lot about the funeral industry. And um, I think I'll pass you back to Kev to tell us a bit more about it. Okay. We know who we are, so we'll move straight on. Um, briefly, what is Earth Funerals? It's, it's a brand, it's a trading model, it's a blueprint. The, the, the brand speaks to values that have to do with uh, perhaps evolutionary desire for a simple return to the Earth. It speaks of um, regenerative practice and, that, and this link between life, death and renewal. There's a trading model that's part of this concept, and it's been a unique um, thing we call a charitable trade corporation, which exactly as it sounds is a, a registered full-blown charity, but one that's designed to trade almost in the same way that a, a commercial business would. And when we bring these parts of it together, we've, we've got a blueprint for a sustainable operation, fiscally sustainable, environmentally sustainable, and with a great focus both on uh, meeting our purpose as a charity, but equally meeting our responsibilities to human beings and their roles within Earth Funerals and, their, and supporting their livelihood. So we have this, this concept, this idea of Earth Funerals, and it, it sits within and, and beside the current funeral industry, which is characterised by small, uh, many small um, operators and a smaller number of large operators. And we're fascinated as we move forward to see how we can hopefully a succeed in our own right but also influence that industry which isn't particularly sustainable and i know that from my time in there moving along um earth funerals i mentioned it's a comp it's a big complex national idea that we've been developing for three years so it's got legal frameworks uh, financial and business planning structures, and we've had fabulous help from pro bono um, partners. And then we come to this this third leg of the chair, and it's it's one we often say that everyone concentrates on legal structures and business plans, but not not enough thought is given to governance. But fortunately, that experience of working in a national level funeral business made me understand how essential this was. So. It's a great question. Gina posed this to me. Other day. Why, why, why sociocracy? Why is that? And, and I've got to say, in all the times that I've worked, in uh, particularly around the funeral industry, I've never seen a full coherent um, system of both management at, at the highest levels, uh, how to structure a, a useful meeting, how to come to policy decisions, how to hold an organisation together, how to link it together how to work all the way down to the practical application and development of the, the goals and aims of the organisation. So when I've, that, what I've come to learn about sociocracy, and particularly the, the sociocratic circle method is represented in these bullet points, it's, it's, it matches what every other aspect of the project that we put together, which is that it's scalable. We can, it can grow with the organisation. It easily aligns with our vision, mission and aims. And most importantly, uh, for me personally, because I, I mentioned I sort of am fortunate to have a wealth of, broad wealth of knowledge around this. I'm also mindful that one of the weaknesses in any emerging business is dependence on one person. And I don't want to be that weak link. So I'm working all the time to make myself non-essential. And I'm, it's becoming so apparent to me now that the sociocratic processes can help transfer that what I know outwards into that organisation and into the structures so that if um, I were to step aside or hit with that proverbial bus, that um, Earth Funerals will continue to, to be what we're setting out to make it to be as we look sort of at 100 and 200 years into the future. So our talk tonight is about workflow and I'm going to hand back to Gina to focus down on this one element of the sociocratic circle method and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. So what do we mean by the concept of workflow? I think it's nice that it's got the word flow in it because we do our best when we're working in our flow. Um, 
And so this is how to get that smooth, functional working and flow across an organisation um, so that there is a smoothness in operations. So within the sociocratic circle method, workflows really can be def defined as follows. It's a system to produce organisation and to organise production. And I really love that turn of phrase because it's not something you hear very often to produce organisation. There's two, um, two aspects or elements really, two keys. One of the reasons for, for doing it in, in a very um, designed framework is so you've got alignment with your vision, mission and aims. So that your vision, mission, aim aren't just a few words that sound good and sit on top of your organisation. They're actually integrated through the organisation into everything you do. So Kev's got a very strong vision for what Earth Funerals could, do, could be, but how is he going to ensure that that ripples down to every operation across Australia that, Earth, that, that uses um, Earth Funerals, Earth Funerals? and ways of operating. So to keep that, that vision and mission strong through the organisation, you, uh, you need good design. And the other thing is to allow for collaborative redesign and refinement so that you are continuously designing and redefining and feedbacking through your system, how you operate, and that you are able to do that collaboratively. So, Design plans can often go two ways. They can either be overly complicated and they're sort of too clever by half and so much so that they end up in the bottom drawer because most people can't understand all this detail and all this information built into the design. And um, so that's not helpful. In the other direction, they, there can be insufficient design thought into how production is carried out and this can lead to a, a lack of delivering on the product. Important steps can be overlooked and you can end up with, with failures. So sociocracy, as in everything, every aspect of sociocracy I find, it looks for this balance of what is the necessary and suffi sufficient amount of design so that you get functionality and you don't overdo it or underdo it. So we're gonna step through and look at at workflow thinking of these things. So let's just start in a context we're all familiar. Um, what is the workflow when we produce a meal? Well, this will, it, this will cover the questions of considering what's for dinner. What ingredients do we have on at hand? What's cooking? And who's eating? So let's just dig into these questions and see what they reveal to us about workflow. The first thing when we look at producing something like a meal is that we can divide the production cycle into three phases. The first is the input phase, that's gathering the ingredients. The second, the transformation phase, the magic that the cook does in the kitchen. And then the third is the output phase to delivering the meal to, uh, to the hungry. So when things go wrong, what, 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 um, what does it look like? Well, have you ever started cooking and found you were missing critical ingredients? Or have you ever burnt a meal and wasted good ingredients? Or have you ever produced a beautiful feature dish and found that you had a guest who couldn't eat it because they were sensitive or allergic to one of the ingredients in the meal? So they're the sort of things that we want to avoid by looking deeper into workflow. And another point I want to make here about looking at workflow in terms of these three phases is the first phase and the last phase, the input and the output, are an exchange processes. So in those situations, there is exchange between the group that's doing the work or the person doing the work and the environment. And whether the environment is the physical environment or the client or the customer or the partner or the, the circle. And 
but there's an exchange with the outside world. And in the middle step, it's just done by the, person, the group or the person doing the work. So the first thing we notice that when you are considering workflow, two thirds of your focus is on the environment. Two out of those three phases are about looking at the exchange with the environment, what's coming in and what's going out. And only one third of your design is in what, what you actually do to produce your product. And I think that's really valuable because often we can think, oh, we're going to design a product. We focus all our energy into that design production phase and we forget about the relating to the environment on either side, getting good agreements about what's required and good agreements on how we deliver. deliver. So let's go to our next slide and see what else we can find when we begin to this in producing a, a meal. Well, we need policy guidelines for how we produce a meal. So in, in the kitchen, in our household habits, most of our policies are actually not written, they're assumed or they're just habits that are built into our behaviour. But the sort, of, the sort of policies that we may find under, that underlie our meal production is that in, ingredients need to be sourced from either the garden or the freezer or the pantry. We need to have ingredients on hand. For what's cooking, there might be some sort of an understanding that the cook decides what to cook and they prepare the meal. So the, the meal decision is in the hands of the cook and it might be that underneath the who's eating, there's an uh, assumed policy that, that we generate a meal that meets individual's dietary requirements. So let's consider those as our underlying policies. So let's have a look at our next slide. So we also will find that we've probably got a, an aim underneath our producing meals. And perhaps that is to produce a healthy and delicious meal. And, um, and then he's showing again the questions um, that need to be answered as far as our, our policy, as to question whether our policies are working. So when we put the meal together, did, did, we, did the cook have sufficient ingredients to actually cook a good healthy meal? Or did they start with a bare fridge? Um, as for what's cooking, was the meal a good use of available ingredients or um, was it a waste of ingredients or were, were they not well put together so that they weren't used to their best value? So the, these are the sort of ways to measure our policy. And, and finally, the policy about dietary requirements, did the meal meet everyone's dietary requirements? So this is our, our measurement questions we may ask to see if our, our underlying policies were met in the production of a meal. So let's go to the next phase. And so we can see, we can lay these out, if you like, on a table where our policies, we refer to as our leading, setting policies as to how we'll do the work. And, and in this chart, we're putting them up the top in that leading section. And then we've got the actual operational doing of the preparation of the meal in the center. And then at the bottom, we can look at the measurements that we made to check that our policies or the way we led were and um, whether they worked, whether they produced a good output. So keep this in image in mind. And um, while we now start swinging into looking in the funeral business, let's just check the next slide. Yeah, so I think now we're back over to you, Kev. Yeah, thanks, Gina. Um, the sociocratic circle method, um, which I assume some of you may be familiar with, it tends to use a vision, mission, aim statement as its sort of central reference point or datum point. And we use um, workflow in the style that Gina's just described as the, as the uh, a disciplined means of turning those aims into practical action. And one of the key tools in that is what's called a nine block chart. So he, here are Earth Funerals, actual vision and mission. Um, the vision is a world where the production and consumption of all goods and services contributes to restoring the ecological balance of our planet. 
fantastic place to live if we could get there. Our mission to do our part towards that is to pioneer a charitable trade corporation that provides an alternative to the commercial funeral sector by fully offsetting the environmental costs of the goods and services produced and by directing all profit from trading activity towards ecological restoration. From there, that organisation that I talked about, this national um, funeral enterprise and network of natural burial grounds would be created through the realisation of 11 aims. I'm not going to go through all of these because they're not relevant specifically to tonight, but quickly there's a, we're looking to put a national operating enterprise together. There's a national network of funeral homes, a national network of natural burial grounds, we're looking to provide both burial and cremation options and to provide environmentally sound, ethically sourced coffins. We want to give people choices, move the barriers out of the road for someone to select a simple natural burial. Clearly, we want, we want to trade, so we're looking for a national awareness. We want to produce revenue because we want to support our people and our purposes. We want to produce those fair livelihoods and also to produce a healthy working environment. And that's something I really believe that socio sociocracy will contribute to. Finally, when we're up and running and at it, we'll be trying to educate the rest of the funeral industry to, to come along for the ride. So, you can apply these workflow pro processes that Jim has talked about to an individual aim or parts of an aim. So I just want you to consider what was aim five on the previous slide, which is to provide environmentally sound, ethically sourced coffins, containers and shrouds. And here we're going to, well, as I say here, this aim has three different elements, coffins, containers and shrouds. So we're just going to focus for this tonight's presentation just on coffins. And here is a nine block chart that Jean is kindly going to explain. when she's not on mute. So, yeah. So if you can now relate this back to the cooking a meal. In the, the middle row, we've got the doing. It's um, where we're going to be producing uh, prototypes and samples. So that's doing the work. Thanks, Kev. And um, up in the top row, we've got leading. We've got our policies that are going to uh, determine how we do that work. And down on the bottom row, we've got our measurements. And so I, the, um, actually I'll ask quest Kev these questions in a minute, but for the purpose of um, producing the prototypes, um, there were three criteria that were, this, that were important relating to the coffin. First of all, uh, that the coffin used a minimal amount of material that it could be of the lightest weight possible and that it could carry a 150 kilogram body. And so then um, the prototypes were made and tested and an organization called a PICRI was um, chosen to uh, generate these and they are in Indonesia. And so you'll notice that in that first co column, a PICRI and Earth Funerals communicated to see what needed to be done to, um, to get the prototype in place. I just realised, Kev, one of our... Yes, I've just seen that as well. <laughs> so in the, in the second column, you'll notice there's also two lo logos of Pickery and Earth Funerals. That Earth Funerals I'm logo sure. on the right should be in the third column. We're trying to emphasise the fact that doing the work, the transformation of materials into a coffin is done by a PICRI alone. And that then in the third col column, again, a PICRI and Earth Funerals do their communications and, and receive the delivered coffin. So that fits, as I was saying before, exchange in the input and output columns, and then in the transformation in the middle, it's just the person doing the work, which in this case, was the organization of PICRI. Now the, the, the policies that we, we've said wrap around that, now in order to be regenerative and to be, build feedback into this system, we want to be measuring whether our policies are doing their job. So the questions we'll be asking of the prototype design standard 
is does the design minimize the use of materials? What does it weigh and will it carry 150 kilograms? And just before we show you what we came up with and how it met those conditions, I just want to um, ask Kev these three questions to give us an example of what he has seen in the funeral industry. As far as, Kev, what wastage have you seen previously in the funeral industry? And what over design have you seen of coffins? And have you ever seen a coffin fail? Um, certainly yes to the last question, which I'd come to. Waste, waste in the funeral industry is extraordinary. Um, uh, culturally, there's differences as well. Uh, there are literally thousands of caskets used every year, particularly in the US, that are made out of metal of a gauge that you would currently make a motor car out of. These things can weigh 90 and 100 kilos without a person in them. And these are placed in the ground and, and uh, given beautiful names and labels on them that say they've got a lifetime guarantee, whatever that means. Um, Again, I mentioned that I'd run a crematorium. There, there is something in me that absolutely feels like crying to watch a, a coffin made out of timber that would be, I'd be happy to have a, a dining room table made out of, um, slide quietly into a, a, a cremation furnace and become ash. So yeah, look, there is, there is waste, there's over-engineering, there's over-design. And many coffins just aren't very good. I've, I've personally seen a coffin that, that slipped from a person's hand as they were moving it. It only dropped six inches, but because it dropped onto its corner, the entire coffin split open. Uh, it, I, I can't tell you what sort of experience that is, but there was just sufficient time, and this happened at the, the funeral home, so... Um, there was just sufficient time to make sure that the, another coffin could be found and replaced. But thereafter, my nervousness at watching anyone carry a coffin anywhere where we weren't able to have a spare was um, uh, horrendous. I think it's, it gave me grey hairs. So, yep, we could certainly do better and we certainly want to do better for earth funerals. So shall we move on? And here's version one of what we call an earth pod, which is made out of uh, wicker, which is a sustainable um, grass that grows in Indonesia, right near the village in Yogyakarta, where a pickery have their fair trade operation. And it's certainly light. This goes back to Gina's measurements. Um, what you may not be able to see there is sitting on that scale, this entire coffin weighs nine kilograms. Easily hold half of it up and still smile, which is lovely. But the real question is, is it strong? So let's have a quick look at strength testing Indonesian style. There we have it. I think it certainly so, means so. Gina, did you want to comment there? I'll just say, just winding up, you know, the sample coffins did meet the prototype design standards. They did align with the aims of Earth Funerals and they also align with the Earth Funerals vision, mission and aim. And, and the production cycle is set up for continuous refinement and new products. If I could just comment there, that last point is so critical. I've, I've 
been involved in coffin design, shroud design, um, and the equipment around body handling. It, and, but that's a personal skill. The work done around the nine block chart and laying out this production process means that if I'm not around or in the future, there's future products to be developed, then, then the, uh, those people who would be involved in running earth funerals will have a blueprint to move forward with. Gina. And our take home me message, whether you want to make dinner or create a national trading entity, the ingredients you need, the sociocratic circle method and some nine block charts. So I think uh, last word from you, Kev. Oh, look, that's, that's where we're at. Um, I'm just so enthusiastic and looking forward to this. You know, we have board meetings with some regularity and uh, becoming, I think, reasonably proficient in um, circle method and getting to consent making decisions. And we're just so keen to continue forward with this um, and be looking at uh, beginning trading for earth funerals um, probably early in 2021. So we've got a lot of work to do, but um, having these systems and this uh, governance, uh, level of governance and organisation takes all the sweat out of it or uh, all the worry out of how we're going to bring together a, a really amazing project. 